So thanks, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, wait for the deck to show up on the screen here. Great. Um, so as I said, I'm going to talk about sort of Bridgewater's experience with managing Vault in a, a federated enterprise. Uh, so before I begin, I'll just talk a little bit about who is Bridgewater, right? A lot of you may not uh, know a lot about the company or only know uh, some of the media reports that have come out. Um, so uh, it's perhaps best embodied by uh, something our head of client service and marketing department said, uh, which is, from a values perspective, we're trying to understand the way the world works. That's what our business is. And so we're really interested in people that have a sort of deep curiosity, people that have the patience to understand deep and complex systems. Whether those are biological systems or economic systems or political systems, it doesn't really matter. Right? So that's fundamentally what our business is. And in particular, what we try and do is research timeless and universal fundamental and systematic principles that drive the world's economies. What do I mean by that? So timeless and universal, we're looking for principles that apply across all time and across all places. Right? We're not just looking at what's the current US economy doing, or, or the US economy during the dot-com boom, uh, or even the Great Depression, but every economic condition. And not just the US, but every market in the world that we can get data for. And fundamental systematic means that we're not just sort of observing correlations, we're trying to reason about the fundamental cause and effect relationships that drive everything. And so that's what Bridgewater is. And we use that uh, understanding to manage about $150 billion, according to Wikipedia, uh, for institutional investors. Our clients are exclusively institutional investors, university endowments, sovereign wealth funds, public school teacher pension funds. So those are the people that we're trying to help with this understanding the world's economies. So why am I here today? Well, Bridgewater is all about very hard technology and security problems. Right? We're a very massively technology-enabled company. Now, I mentioned timeless and universal, right? We want to stress test our ideas across all available data. Fundamental and systematic, we want to apply our ideas in a repeatable fashion. These are things that humans are just terrible at doing, but computers are great. And so without the benefit of technology, we'd be impossible to implement our business model. Uh, and again, we have $150 billion that we're managing, and the sad truth is bad people are going to be out there and wanting to uh, steal some of it or all of it if they can. Uh, security is critical to the survival of the business, but even more importantly, it's critical to protecting our clients that we have a fiduciary responsibility to helping out. When we hurt, our clients are actually the ones who are getting hurt. Uh, and our business is committed to keeping the technology of the company cutting edge. Right? We're pushing the boundaries of the technology and security world in order to better deeply understand what's going on in the world today. Uh, and lastly, we love HashiCorp. I think it was Mitchell uh, who said that Quote, there was a religious alignment in the way Bridgewater and HashiCorp think about technologies. Now, I don't know if Mitchell's about to start his own religion, um, but uh, we still have a lot in common. So why we care about federation? So we believe, as most people do, in security and depth, right? So we want to minimize the blast radius of any potential compromise or any bad actor. And so we want separation of responsibilities as a key component of that. So separation of responsibilities across our different departments. So those people who are researching, say, the way the world's economies work aren't necessarily going to be the same people researching and understanding and having access to our ideas about how do we minimize transaction costs. But we want to go even further than that. So we're not just separation of responsibilities across departments, but even within departments. So for example, people researching foreign exchange might be different from those researching credit markets. Um, and we think Vault is awesome. I probably shouldn't have to tell you all this. Uh, because you're all here today, but really it gives a uh, more holistic management framework as opposed to just some sort of sharing framework that leaves a lot to be desired. Um, but Vault does have some limitations for this type of federation that we're looking for. Um, so what should a Vault of Bridgewater look like? Uh, the first thing we want is we want hard security boundaries. So a group should have access uh, to its secrets and full access to its secrets, but nobody else's and vice versa. We want it to be self-sufficient. So I don't want to have to be the operator who's sort of reviewing and approving every change to make sure that people in this group aren't granting themselves access to somebody else's data. Um, I should be able to delegate down further. I want to be able to compose this and uh, build something up so that, again, I'm not, uh, we don't have, say, a, a research department who's managing QA's teams and their dev teams. Uh, we want to be able to sort of separate that out and federate and delegate down. Uh, and our customers talk about it and they say, we love Vault. Uh, but we want Vault as a service, not as a library. We don't want to run our own Vault installation. We want to be able to just consume a Vault service. So what's the problem, right? 
Vault allows mounting custom secret backends. It allows policies controlling granular access to those backends. And so far, so good, right? The tricky part is that Vault does not allow delegating management of only subsets of those secret backends. Uh, and, but we want departments to own their own destiny, which means that they need to be able to control just a particular subset of those uh, secret backends across the company. So a couple of solutions here, right? The first one is uh, what I call multi-vault, where you basically spin up a unique vault instance per security boundary. Um, has great security isolation, right? This is sort of what's built into the product. You can grant management of each of vault's policies to the group requesting that instance, uh, but it's difficult to spin up new vault instances. From the documentation, it says, unsealing makes the process of automating a vault install difficult. Uh, unsealing is a very manual process. And so for the time being, the best method is to manually unseal multiple vault servers in HA mode. And that's great if you have just one vault instance you want to keep up all the time, but it's tricky if you want to dynamically expand and contract the number of vault instances that you have. You have to keep track of who manages which conceptual instance. And this could also have compliance implications for people who are in heavily regulated, regulated industries uh, if you may need some sort of penetration test or audit done uh, against any new vault cluster that's holding your sensitive data. Um, and so again, there's also additional instances to maintain, monitor, patch, upgrade. All that nonsense that we want to sort of get away from was we move more towards a serverless world. Um, you now, uh, Armand announced Vault Enterprise yesterday. I'm excited by the possibilities, but I haven't played with it in depth. Um, I think down the road, this is probably the right solution uh, going in that direction, but it's not quite there yet for us today. Um, so the second solution we'll talk about is basically a multi-tenant vault. Right, the goal is to provide a vault service which allows customers to fully manage their own assets, but nobody else. Right, so my customers should be able to do pretty much anything that's scoped except create new top-level delegations, which would be pretty minimal. Um, it's not built natively into vault, uh, and so it'll require a little bit of work to get going. Um, before I go, I'll just take a little bit of diversion into a uh, quick vault security model here. Right? So in order to think about how are we going to create that multi-tenancy and create the boundaries within a vault instance, we need to understand uh, what are the uh, particularities that we have to manage. Um, so a secret backend is sort of the first thing you're probably familiar with. Right? Basically, a secret backend is worthless until you effectively load it with some sort of sensitive information. So for example, a console backend would need a console management token. Once it has a console management token, then you have to start caring about things like, um, can I sort of redirect that back end to my evil console instance and steal the management token, right? You have to protect it once you load it. Similarly, like a PKI backend needs a CA certificate's private key. A generic backend is worthless until you actually encrypt sensitive data with it and generate the key. Um, so that's sort of a secret backend. Policies, uh, now these are fun. They define what's allowed on which secret backends. And the last thing to talk about is an authentication backend. An authentication backend does two things. The first thing it does is it defines what's sufficient evidence to trust an identity assertion. Whether that's, I trust you because you've typed in the username and password that I'm validating against an LDAP uh, server, or you're supplying a client-side TLS certificate uh, from an issuer I trust, or you just happen to be able to log into a GitHub instance, which I trust, right? So it defines that sufficient, uh, what's sufficient evidence to trust it. And then once it trusts it, it maps that identity to a set of policies uh, that define what that identity is allowed to do. Um, so let's talk about a secret backend. Uh, so the thing to protect essentially is a mount point. And as I mentioned earlier, you have to care about the metadata of that secret backend. Uh, for example, who can access it? Uh, where is it actually pointing to under the hood? You have to make sure you're taking care of all of that. Um, and so what this means is my customer should be able to generate a secret backend freely. And I only care about it after it's mounted and they've put sensitive data in it. Uh, and I have to provide a means to control access to these backends. And so my goal is that customers should be able to freely modify policies, but if and only if those policies only affect secret backends that they're entitled to manage. All right, so what's my design for this thing gonna look like? Uh, the first thing I wanna do is I want to logically group my secret backends. I'm gonna group them into essentially security level equivalence classes. Uh, so everything within a particular conceptual class, uh, I'm going to say these people are trusted to essentially completely own that. Um, and then I need to scope my policy management operations. Again, policies define actions that are allowed uh, for a given secret backend, and so if I limit what is targeted by a policy, I can then delegate out uh, that management of a particular policy, but I have to be able to limit what I can target. Um, and then I have to scope my authentication backends so that they only allow mapping to these scoped policies. And so the overall flow is I have an authentication backend 
that maps identity assertions of policies, and so it's only allowed to map a given identity assertion to a scoped policy, and that scoped policy only defines access on a certain subset of the secret backends in an instance. Uh, so vault secret backends, just a quick note. Uh, again, the documentation, whenever a secret backend is mounted, a random UUID is generated. This becomes a data root for that backend. Whenever that backend writes to the physical storage layer, it is prefixed with that UUID folder. Since the vault storage layer doesn't support relative access, such as dot dot, this makes it impossible for a mounted backend to access any other data. So uh, I just want to say this makes namespacing so much easier. So I want to say, first of all, thank you very much to the HashiCorp team for uh, this particular security feature. I'm probably abusing it in a little way, but it uh, still makes me happy anyway. Um, all right, so the last thing I'm going to do is a diversion into a language called JSONnet. Um, many of you probably aren't that familiar with it. Um, so it's a purely functional language uh, that outputs JSON. Um, it's built by uh, people at Google, though it's not an official Google product. Uh, it addresses a lot of the shortcomings of JSON. So it has variables, has closures, has comprehensions, it has includes. Um, and probably the most important feature it adds on top of JSON to make it manageable is comments. Um, and so I think it's a really good fit into this ecosystem what we're talking about here. So in terms of JSON plus fault, right, what I want to do is define a configuration of a vault cluster that has what are the secret backends, what are the policies controlling access to them, and what are the off backends that map identities to those policies. And I think this should be as thin a layer as possible on top of a native vault configuration. Um, then I'm going to use JSON to build that JSON. Uh, and then I'm going to include my different business units as configuration in order to enable them and let them do what they need to do. Um, and then I'm going to retain some centralized control over it where necessary so that I can still insert myself and say, you're not allowed to do these things because ultimately, you know, we don't fully trust our uh, business users not to shoot themselves in the foot. All right, so enough talk. Um, let's all look at a little bit of code here. Um, so this is basically a sample configuration file. Um, and here's your pointer. All right, uh, so you can see I'm defining three different uh, objects here. I define a set of secret backends a set of authentication backends, and a set of policies. And what I'm doing in each place is I'm merging them in. I'm giving some defaults that could be common everywhere, and here there aren't any, but uh, sort of the framework is there to demonstrate that you can actually do this. Um, and the same thing with my auth backends, I'm merging them together, and my policies, I'm merging them together. Um, and so what I'm doing is I'm building a conceptual namespace to enforce the security boundaries that I want. Uh, and this gives me centralized control. And so here I'm just doing a little bit of namespacing, uh, but you can and should do something a little more. So for example, let's say you don't trust your GitHub to be uh, a true identity store. You can, as an enterprise, disallow and say any GitHub off backend is just filtered out or air out. So it gives you the ability to put that control in place and have some tighter guards around what people are doing. Um, and the other thing is, so you see here, I'm sort of importing the different config files. And these are really just sort of examples here. Um, they can live anywhere. Uh, you can store them in different Git repositories. You can permission them differently. Uh, you can have your continuous deployment system just check them out from wherever they are and put them in the right location so that you can compose all this together. And then most of the magic here is in this uh, policyutils.json file. Um, and this is what it looks like. Um, it's actually a little bit simpler than it looks. Uh, there's some messiness that I'll get to in a second. Um, but essentially, you see the three namespace functions over here. Um, and each namespace function knows how to properly namespace uh, what goes on in, underneath it. So for example, uh, the uh, namespace is secret backend. The only thing I really care about is a field. When I talk about off backends, uh, a little nice look at that, but policies, I need to namespace two things. The first is the path of the secret backend they're granting access to. And the second is the name so that I keep my different business units from colliding over each other. Uh, and then policies. Policies are the sort of nasty one here um, because uh, essentially, well, the first thing I have to do is I have to namespace the path, again, so I keep my different business units from stepping onto each other. But then the policies they take in is actually just a comma-separated list. So it's not a proper list object. It's a comma-separated list. So what I have to do is split, split it on the comma, prefix each object, and then rejoin it with a comma. Uh, and that's what 90% of the messiness here is uh, trying to support. Um, and so let's look at some of the sample policies. Uh, so the first is, uh, the very first thing I imported was, say, my department A policy.json. Um, and so there's a sample. The first thing I do here is I define a, a variable. Uh, and this is going to be my secret backend. Um, and so path is secret. You can see the type is generic, and I want to mount it. 
Uh, and then it shows writing some data to us. I'm going to basically encrypt this uh, BAS variable. Um, and this particular instance is not particularly useful, uh, but it allows you to do other things. Like, let's say a department has their, wants to put their console management token in there. Um, they could write that into a given secret backend once they've mounted it in order to configure it more fully. Uh, so the next thing here I sort of define as my auth backend. Uh, and again, it's uh, path is AWS EC2. This is all a relative path that's going to be namespaced. Uh, here's the type. Um, and then here I'm actually setting it up and saying, OK, um, I'm creating an example role here. Um, and I'm mapping uh, basically uh, to this instance profile using one of the newly released features that I particularly like. And here's the policy, so the secret backend config. And it says, OK, uh, if you're using the uh, AWS EC2 auth backend at this location, and you're in this instance profile, you can get access to these policies. Uh, and this is really just where I define everything. So here's the secret backend, here's the auth backend, uh, and then the policies uh, shows here that I'm creating a couple subdirectories underneath there uh, that allows you to read and list one location, uh, create, read, update, delete, list a uh, different location. Uh, composition, right? I said before, I want to subdelegate out. So say my research department wants to create a separate area just for the QA team to manage uh, the QA stuff. Uh, and so this is actually very trivial. Um, in function, or in form, this looks very similar to the top level here. Um, and again, the idea is it just shows that uh, this is naturally composing in the way that it, it comes together. Um, and in here, this is just importing a different one. So I have my utility function, I have uh, uh, the include, and then I'm just sort of namespacing everything there. Um, and what does that look like? Well, the thing that I'm including here, this is identical to the other policy for department A. And the reason I'm doing that is to demonstrate, uh, and I'll get to the output JSON, that in fact it actually is identical, uh, and I'm namespacing it all properly. So here's the secret backend, my auth backend, uh, and then the policies and the way they mount. So all this comes together to produce uh, a JSON string, or a JSON document. Uh, and here you can see that, so this is the order that JSON it outputs. Uh, there's the auth backend. Uh, you can see that I have a path that's properly prefixed with department A underscore. Um, and the policies it maps to there have also been properly prefixed. So that's not, so therefore I'm not going to be able to abuse this to get access to a secret backend that I don't want, and it's going to prevent uh, different groups from writing over each other. Uh, the same thing for department B. You can see the path here is, again, department B underscore QA underscore, because those are the two levels that we nested them. Uh, and then the same thing with the secret backend here. Uh, it's also been doubly prefixed. Uh, when you get to the policies, um, again, so there's the name, so prefix in order to permit collisions, uh, and the path is also prefixed uh, as well uh, on the secret backends so that you scope the policies. Uh, and then the same thing with the, the QA teams, which has been also sort of fully prefixed. Uh, and then the secret backends, exactly what you expect, so there's the path, uh, and you can see the other prefix path. Um, so that gives you some JSON, and so now I've generated a JSON document that sort of describes my vault configuration. Uh, and then it's just some simple Python in order to apply it. Um, this particularly uses the HVAC library. Um, basically, I'm omitting a lot of the boilerplate here of like configuring vault and all of that, because it's not very interesting. Um, but so the first thing we do is we go through, mount all the secret backends and the auth backends, and there's a little bit of trickiness in that auth backends sort of have this slash auth prefix in some locations, but not others. Uh, and then we go through and just uh, write all the policies. Uh, so the write method, very simple, uh, basically exactly what you expect, uh, just sort of formatting the path. Uh, the policy set operation, again, sort of setting the policy, uh, formatting the path, getting the policy, so it allows you to, um, again, generate different subpaths within it. Um, enabling secret backends, enabling off backends, um, again, all of what you'd expect. Um, and so that's sort of uh, how we then can apply that to a vault. Um, so some limitations. Um, I know this isn't perfect, right? Um, and so the first thing is, as I said before, I'm adding a multi-tenancy layer on top of Vault. Um, and in particular, security isolation from this is never going to be as strong as a multi-Vault. doesn't mean it's not OK. Uh, it's just you have to be OK with accepting a little bit, little bit of this risk here. Uh, example, uh, something else is, one thing I'm explicitly not trying to do is I'm not trying to make the secret backends themselves multi-tenant. Uh, so some examples to consider, right? Say a shared console cluster where you have a shared global namespace for service discovery. 
Like I'm not trying to sort of register services or with the PKI backend and globally trusted PKI. I'm also not trying to sort of limit who can get what names. Uh, and of course, these are both examples of naming things. We know that there's two hard things in computer science, cache invalidation and naming things. And this may not be exactly what uh, they had in mind when they talked about naming things, but it's still, I think, an instance of the problem where naming is pretty hard. Um, that's something else. Clients have to know how do this namespacing works, so it's not totally transparent. I like something that's a little more transparent to my clients, but it uh, isn't there. So the people who are writing the policies have to sort of know uh, that's going to happen, especially the ones subdelegate. Uh, but then the applications have to know where things are going to be prefixed properly. Not the most elegant solution, but uh, I don't think it's sort of a fatal flaw. Um, you can't reclassify a secret backend easily because it's going to require remounting at a different location. In some cases, that can destroy some of the data. Um, so essentially, you're going to need to create a new one and then manually copy the secrets over. Uh, probably some manual operations on the storage back end in order to make that happen, and it's going to be unsupported. But uh, I'm sure all the helpful folks at HashiCorp on the mailing list will guide you along. Uh, and cross-group permissions are going to be a little tricky. Um, and so effectively, sorry, uh, the basic idea here is that the group that owns the data needs to grant access to an identity from a different account. So our research department produces ideas, uh, but somebody actually needs to execute those trades. So they basically have to permission our trading department to pull the generated trades, but only the generated trades. And that keeps uh, the data ownership solely within the team that owns it. Uh, so just a bit of a summary. Um, so again, I've basically told you, here's a way to sort of conceptually create a multi-tenant vault. Um, it is a synthetic security boundary, so it's going to be inherently less secure, right? So, um, you know, there aren't any unit tests in the vault framework that are enforcing the assumptions that I'm making, um, and so there's going to be inherently increased risk of security vulnerabilities, uh, in particular if there's assumptions I don't even know that I'm making here or that you're making. Um, and so even if it's perfectly secure today, there's not a guarantee that something won't change in the future to sort of change the security uh, posture of this. Uh, so consider a hybrid solution. Uh, maybe may work for you. Uh, if you have a multi-tenant non-production vault instance, uh, and so all of the less sensitive stuff everyone just goes into multi-tenant. Uh, maybe you have a single-tenant vault instance for your secret sauce, so the things that you, it'd be catastrophic if they got out or got leaked or got compromised. You may want to add that additional uh, security layer in there. Um, and then maybe you have a multi-tenant vault instance for everything else, right? So I sort of start off by saying my ideal is I want zero cross-team trust. And I still sort of hold that ideal, but it's really, really difficult in real life to achieve that. Um, and if you're willing to compromise a little bit, then this may work well. And you may say, look, I don't fully trust, you know, I'm a researcher and I don't fully trust all those people over in trading, um, but I'm sort of willing to trust that some of the, their uh, trusted operators aren't going to really try and intentionally screw with me if they have to go through 20 hoops. Um, so it can enable uh, this in different types of environments. Uh, and so. You know, there's not a one-size-fits-all solution. What you decide is going to depend on your business's security profile uh, and the risk appetite. Um, and so lastly, I'd uh, like to have some acknowledgments. Uh, so Will Usher and Dan Peebles from Bridgewater. Uh, Will worked very close with me, lot of, wrote a lot of the code that you see on the screen. So if there's anything you don't like, blame Tim. Just kidding. Um, and Dan's been a really great thought partner uh, when you think about security and Vault and how that's going to work. Um, and especially some of the core HashiCorp uh, guys who are working on Vault for just making such a fantastic product. Uh, we're really in love with it. Um, and so yeah, if anyone has any questions, uh, there's my email address. Feel free to email me. Join us at the happy hour tonight. I'm happy to chat. Um, and so uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh,